I have to say my education in Chinese poetry uh, was somewhat biased in the way that it excluded um, this particular genre of poetry, zhu zhi ci, bamboo branch song or verse. Um, the only zhu zhi ci I knew before I encountered uh, Lana Chan's work was um, actually two lines by a Tang Dynasty poet, uh, Liu Yuxi. Um, and I read uh, in Mandarin, of course, excuse me. Dong bian yi chu xi bian yu, dao shi wu qing, chue yu qing. Dong bian yi chu xi bian yu is uh, sunny on the east and raining on the west. And um, uh, to call it a fine day, and it is not a fine day. But then we know qing uh, as a as a character, it could, could mean sunny or fine day, but also feeling or emotion or love. So it's playful, and that's really a feature of uh, this genre. And um, so what I, I say here is really something that I, I read about recently and just to share rather than, it's impressionistic rather than uh, out of deep study. Um, I've, to me, it's a very beguiling and, and deceptive type of genre. It is called zhu zhi ci, and yet it is not a ci. At least it's not the, the type of lyric poetry that um, we're familiar with as written by the great Song Dynasty poets, um, Su Dongpo and Li Qingzhao, and those people, the classics. And um, maybe the only thing they share is their connection with music. And maybe uh, at the very beginning, there's a connection with folk song or f folk literature. Um, but and in spirit and in sentiment and aesthetics, it's very different. Yeah, I think um, Duncan already mentioned the, the popular elite uh, dynamic or tension, you might call, uh, that's running through different genre formations in Chinese poetry, and this is a very typical example of that. And if you look at the form, um, it is a quatrain, four lines per stanza, and seven syllable, seven syllabic lines. So qi yan jue ju, yeah? So you might call this a qi yan jue ju, but it's not a jue ju, yeah? It's not a jue ju in, in spirit, in sensibility, in um, the type of uh, aesthetics. Yeah, jue jiu, uh, in traditional Chinese poetry is actually quite an elevated form uh, since the Tang Dynasty. Whereas if you look at these uh, stanzas, they touch upon very everyday and you might call even mundane subjects, um, like the weather, like uh, the kinds of clothes young people wear these days in the streets, and like keeping a, a fruit shop, a vegetable shop. Um, so it's not a ci, and yet it has ci in the title, and in form, it's a quatrain, it's not a jue ju. And another thing is, um, it is written in a very plain, um, in some ways, very accessible type of language, and yet it is, in other ways, quite varied and colorful and inaccessible. And early we talk about the hybridity of the language, mixing Mandarin uh, vocabulary with Cantonese. And in this particular stanza that um, um, Yao Wen beautifully realized here, the last phrase is, um, I think it's a trans, dana is dollar. So they're trying to sell vegetable fruits to make money. So it's a transliteration of the English word dollar. So it's a very uh, hybrid type of language. And the tone can be very um, earthy and jocular, humorous, and yet the intent is quite serious. I think these poets saw themselves as observers and commentators of local customs and local 
uh, folkways, local history, and uh, perhaps even um, with intent for these as being uh, vehicles for more education or edification. You know, so it's very serious in intent, and yet the tone is quite jocular. And it never descends into doggerel. Yeah, so I think people coming from a more classical uh, literary training might dismiss this type of writing as having very little literary value. Uh, but then it's part and parcel of the genre. So earlier I mentioned the Tang Dynasty poet Liu Yuxi. It turns out that he was the first poet, uh, well-known poet, who, um, who you might say, um, discovered this regional folk song form in Sichuan province, where he was demoted to during a part of his uh, uh, official career. And Duncan earlier mentioned, it's associated from the very start with this location. Yeah. But then Liu Yuxi still, he was a scholar official yeah, and a well-known poet. So he, his position with this material is he, uh, very much in the, in the style of the earlier uh, poets from the days of the Book of Songs in Confucian times. You know, going to the, to the periphery, you know, to the to, uh, remote areas to collect you know, the feng ya song, you know, the feng in particular in the Book of Songs is very much about local customs and local ways. You know. um, and yet he, what he did is he, he turned it into a written form and yet he brought it to the center. Okay. And however, it never became a, a very uh, predominant form. It was very much reserved for that type of purpose to record local customs, uh, almost like a travel log type of writing um, in, in mainstream poetic circles. But then I think in the 19th century, towards the 20th century, it really captured the imagination of uh, the Chinese diaspora. Uh, people took, it with, took this form with them to wherever they, wherever they went. So, so we have this series called Hui Ling Dun, which is a Wellington bamboo branch form. But you can imagine, you can put any kind of location. Yeah. Uh, Xinjiapo or Nanyang, yeah? Southeast Asian, Jiu-Jitsu, and Taiwan, even Hong Kong. You know, they have different regional <coughs> um, um, uh, repertoires, you know, and then uh, specifically recording the, the local ways. So I see this type of um, flourishing of this genre very much a, if you, if you say poets like Liu Yuxi appropriated the folk form and made it into a literati type of writing. Um, then the, the migrant um, uh, scholars and poets, they reappropriated it. Yeah, because you see their position with the, they, they are the locals, or they became the locals. Yeah? So they're no longer the people from the center traveling to these faraway areas and then collect these things and, and take them back they actually settled down. So I think that's an important shift yeah, in the, the bamboo branch verse. Uh, in a way, it's a more localized form. It's a kind of a real problem, maybe even reclaimed form of folk, folk song writing. Yeah. But then because of the mediation of the, 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 the uh, literati, uh, the form is actually, in, if you see, quite classical and uh, regulated. And yet, in spirit, it's wild and free, and it's quite um, colorful and uh, hybrid and uh, mixed. <clears throat> so I think, to me, um, the writers, another thing I would mention before I hand it over to Yawen, I realize that um, <coughs> time is limited, uh, is that the flourishing of these uh, bamboo branch songs um, in overseas Chinese communities in the Chinese diaspora had to do with the rise of print culture because the, the Chinese newspapers, such as the New Zealand Growers uh, Journal, <coughs> uh, 
afforded this type of writing a new audience, a new type of readership. So, uh, so not only did the, the, the authors, the poets change, the readership also changed. And I think um, the bamboo branch verse writers, they saw themselves as, um, they took on the role of the literati in their newfound communities. And yet they saw themselves through writing this type of poetry as recorders and observers and commentators of local history and customs. Um, I'm sure that was on Lao No Chan's mind as well. And by having this discussion here today, uh, we're celebrating that as well as fulfilling its promise because indeed we're treating it as, as an important part of New Zealand Chinese local history.